It's the only wrestling podcast on earth hosted by a two-time former Major League Baseball All-Star Comeback Player of the Year, the head coach himself, Dimitri Young. I love that, Dennis. That was good. Good. I'm doing <laughs> fine, by the way. Good, good. This guy's been rocking your balls off all around the world. One of my favorite people and one of my favorite punk bands on earth, it's Lars Fredrickson. I'm super glad you didn't say fondling balls. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I'll see you next week. Well, that was good. I feel like I feel like it, I'm in the same company uh. as Dimitri for once. But <laughs> last but not least, our uh, fearless leader, Mr. Dennis Farrell. Give it up for Dennis for putting this Thank one together. Thank and you. Dennis, tell, tell him who we got tonight because this is exciting. This is a Petey Williams setup who Petey could not be here last minute bailout. But listen, Frankie Kazarian is on the show, someone we are super excited for. We are all huge friends, fans of yours, Frankie, from AEW to TNA to even PGW and your band Gutter. Was it Gutter Candy? I got to tell you, thank you first and foremost for giving up some of your time to talk to us nerds. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. I'm glad I'm here. Uh, very nice to meet you guys. Uh, those of you that I haven't met, I'm just bummed Petey can't join us, man. It was great to hear from him. He's yeah. he's one of my oldest friends in the business, one of my favorite opponents. I was psyched to to reminisce and to, uh, to wax poetic with him. But alas, real life gets in the way sometimes, huh? I guess I'll start this off. And you were talking about Petey here for a second. What are some of your early memories of Petey? I guess growing up in the early TNA days together. Yeah, I remember Petey first coming in. Uh, he was really young. We were all just kids back in the AEW. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, TNA Asylum days. And Petey came in, and uh, we just, uh, you know, he was um, brought in by a guy named Scott Demore, who's a friend of mine, and we were uh, we just kind of hit it off. Really, you know, we were all X Division guys, and all you know, working together all the time, and. Uh, we had a, kind of a little crew of guys at the time that hung out after the shows. Uh, you know, you had like your hardcore partiers and you had your mid-level partiers and you had kind of us that would sometimes go out and get crazy and sometimes just hang out in our room and be goofs and watch movies. And that was like myself and Petey and Chris Sabin and Alex Shelley and uh, guys like that. So um, we hit, we hit it off, you know, right away. Petey became a real good friend and throughout his entire time in, in TNA, when you're there together, he's one of my favorite people, my favorite guys to hang with, my favorite guys to be in the ring with. And uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of crazy nights in Nashville and Orlando and just just some really good memories. Lars? Yeah, I was I was gonna ask you, you know, are you're a California guy, right? I am a California guy, born and bred, man. Yeah. Yeah, me me, me too. So um yeah. I I've, I've seen you a hundred times up here in the Bay Area. That's where I live, and I'm I'm born and raised up here. I've seen you uh, and, and a few different promotions up here. And we were talking about uh, what number suicide were you? Were you number two? <laughs> no. So I was the original. You were the original. I was okay. the original. Yeah. That was uh, that was a, the idea was presented to me when I was still Frankie Kazarian and they wanted to get this character on television and picked me and I was uh, adamantly against it at first. Um, but uh, you know, that's what was asked of me. So I, I did my job. Um, the thing is I filmed all the vignettes and uh, I actually got hurt. I tore my tricep. And uh, so I did the first few things and then I got hurt. And then uh, Chris Daniels took over and then I came back. And right when I came back, I tore my bicep actually like a month into coming back. And then I was out for a, a good five or six months. And um, I think Chris Daniels took over then. And then when I came back, I was the character throughout the duration uh, until I was reintroduced as myself. And then they had a couple other guys do the character. Now they're on number nine, 10. I don't know. Yeah, because we were confused. Sorry, sorry. No, we no, were confused no, no, no. Because Christopher Daniels, we knew, I knew that he, he at one point he stepped in for you, but I couldn't remember yeah. Chronologically, how you came in because there's, you know, at that point in time of wrestling, it was changing every five minutes. So you, yeah, any, any any time that you could kind of get a your hand in it, like uh, um, something else would change. So that's good to know. Thanks for clearing that up, Dimitri. Yeah, so. I was the original, and it's funny if you look at the early pictures. Uh, 
there, there is a way to tell which one is me and which one is Chris Daniels, but I'm not going to give that secret up. Uh, but it's, but it's, there's, a, there's an interesting way to tell. And yeah, you know, man, I had a lot of ideas for that character. Uh, we, we, but we both did uh, just that I thought would make it really cool. Like I wanted, I wanted to make Suicide like TNA's version of Tiger Mask and have, have it be like a legacy character. But uh, those that were in charge at the time at TNA didn't, didn't uh, share that creative vision and mm -hmm. uh so it just kind of the character ultimately kind of you know it's back now i guess but it dies and comes back and dies and comes back yeah. so well i'm a big fan of your tag team stuff that you've done over the years especially with one christopher daniels and that goes way way back to the days in tna yeah. one how did that start up where you two started tagging and it got to where it is today y'all are underrated one of the best tag teams of all time if you really look at what y'all have done around the you know the professional wrestling world so I, i'm just curious about that because i like christopher daniels just as much as what you bring to the table and then also scorpio sky yeah well thank you for that uh i mean chris daniels and i chris daniels i've known for you know i've been a professional wrestler for almost 23 years and i've known him for all but six months of that so he's uh He's been a friend and a traveling companion for many years. He's, you know, he's, he's the best man at my wedding. He's a brother at this point. And we had reached a point, at, <clears throat> excuse me, at TNA where we were with a group called Fortune with uh, myself and Chris Daniels and Bobby Roode and Rick Flair was with us. And that group and AJ and that group had kind of dissolved. And uh, uh, the remnants of that, Chris Daniels and I kind of found ourselves on an island without anything to do. And at the time, the tag team scene had kind of really depleted at TNA, and we thought, well, this is a good opportunity for maybe us to become a tag team. Uh, and it was perfect timing. We had, we had great chemistry as opponents. We found out we had great chemistry as partners as well. And uh, so we were off and running, and luckily enough, we got a lot of uh, opportunity and time to showcase what we could do, um, you know, not only in the ring, but uh, – with, with promos and with vignettes and with our, with, with our speaking and everything. So that just took off. And, and that was a, a decade ago and, you know, we're teaming, we're obviously teaming again in AEW, but we've been a team ever since. And uh, so it just, you know, he's Chris Daniels, Chris Daniels and Frankie Kazarian are always going to be associated in pro wrestling. And I'm totally cool with that because he's been by my side since day one. Whether it keeps going or it ends, SCU has been one of the most entertaining things I've seen out of your career. And the current, I would say the current way it's going now in storyline, I love how it's up in the air. Is it going to keep going? Is it not? And when you step back out of character and you look at SCU, you look at your career, you look at uh, Christopher Daniels, facing him in the ring, does that kind of, even at this point in your career, excite you? Or would it, would it kind of be something that you guys have done a few times? If it splits up, you would rather go your own way. Uh, I mean, just Chris Daniels and I certainly have been opponents dozens of times, more than that probably. Uh, it's just been so long. It's been so long since we were, you know, uh, opposition because we've just been a tag team or a faction for so many years. Honestly, it would be strange to stand across from him, from him in the ring, of course, you know, he's one of the, he's one of the best wrestlers I've ever been in the ring with. So anytime I get an opportunity to wrestle somebody that talented, I'll take it. But at this honest to God, at this point, it would be almost surreal to wrestle against him instead of with him. But, uh, you know, if that's something down the pipeline that I have to do, then so be it. But I just, you know, I, I at this point I see Chris Daniels as an ally and not an opponent, but, uh, I think if anybody could bring out the best of Chris Daniels, it's me. I think I know him. Uh, as good, if not better, than any other person in the business. And um, let's put it this way: anybody that uh, gets the opportunity to wrestle Christopher Daniels comes out a better professional wrestler because of it. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I want—I'm so glad Dimitri brought up the tag team aspect of your career because, I mean, obviously you're heavily decorated as a singles and, and as a, and as a tag team, and. Uh, I remember one of the first times, I think it was when you and when I saw you and Daniel's tag was against the Ballard brothers. And I can't oh, remember boy. if it was, you remember that they were kind of like the hockey guys? Yeah. Oh yeah. The Ballard yeah. brothers to this day are friends of mine. Yes. 
Okay, so, but I remember that match because, you know, I'd seen the Ballard, Ballard Brothers a hundred times, but that match in particular, you guys elevated them and, and, and made them seem like, you know, on that level. And I want to talk about a little bit about, about that. It's like when you and, and Daniels would go into, uh, you know, a ring with another team that maybe weren't as good as you guys. What was the, what was like the psychology going in? Were you trying to make them as well as you guys? You know, I mean, I know some people are selfish, but you guys never seem that way. So I wondered if that was like kind of purposeful. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, at that point, at that match you're talking about, Chris Daniels and I were a well-oiled machine. And, uh, you know, the idea is to go in there and to, you know, not only get yourself over, get your opponents over, get the match over. And um, that was always our mindset going in. And oftentimes when we, especially doing independence across the country, when we would come to a new town, we would be in there with a team that was less experienced than us and, uh, you know, wasn't maybe as well known in the mainstream wrestling world. So, uh, you know, and so, of course, we're going to be the guys that are leading the match and the guys that and that's honestly, that's our job, Lars, is to is to elevate. You know, I want, I want every time I go out there and wrestle the younger guy, I want him to come out a better wrestler because of that, because I had guys that I went out there and wrestled and they did that for me. So that's that's the uh, that's the idea, you know, is that they come they come they come out looking better than when they went in because for a lot of these teams, you know, you come into a town, there's you you have an established tag team you're wrestling, you come in as the name tag team, you wrestle them, you're gone. That tag team's still there. So hopefully right, right. by you know giving them the rub is a word we use in the business. They're better. Their game is elevated. They can continue. You just get in that chemistry and they'll in turn do that for another team. So uh, recently in the last few years, we've been in that position a lot where we've been in there with younger teams and experienced teams in some instances, teams comprised of two guys that grew up watching us, which is, which is strange <laughs> to me still. So uh, yeah. So always the idea is, you know, let's, yes, let's elevate them. Let's make them better for being in the ring with us. And let's uh, you know, let's let the, let, you know, let's give the crowd a show. Let's, you know, because this, th these are all things that were done to us. You know, these are all things that we, we all had guys that took us under their wings and, you know, brought us and, you know, had matches with, and we, you know, you, it's on the job training. Professional wrestling is so much on the job training. You can learn so much in a school and at the gym, but un until you're in that ring, that's when you really learn. Now you mentioned elevating talent and I asked about um, Sc Scorpio Sky, but it was a long question. You know, yep. uh, but between you and Christopher Daniels, with with y'all's age and your maturity and experience, he seems like he's going to be a main event guy in years to come. What are the things that behind the scenes that you're telling him as far as a uh, push is concerned? Uh, you know, Sky's got all the tools, man. Like I, I, I saw something special in Sky back in. 2005 in PWG and I actually specifically asked to to do something with him and they were uh they were cool enough to give me a lot of creative freedom so Scorpio Sky and myself had a year long feud back in the indies and became very good friends and uh you know and so when when we had the opportunity to add a third guy to our team in 2017 Sky was the first guy we could think of because he was one of those guys that had all the he looked like a million bucks he could work he could talk he had all the tools but you know just never caught that break. I mean, you guys, you guys are athletes and musicians, you know, that timing is everything. And, you know, just sometimes certain guys just don't get that break. And he was one of those guys. So, uh, so when he came in, you know, he, like I said, he had all the tools down, the fundamentals, you know, if anything, we've stressed this guy is just, I think he's learned a lot of, um, a lot of how to do business behind the scenes from Chris and I, and like, you know, you know, the, and the type of attitude to display and, you know, when to show your cards, when to not, you know, I think, I think I can safely say we've helped him out with a lot of the business into pro wrestling because the guy, you know, inside the ring, there's nothing I'm going to teach him. The guy's, he's great, you know, but I think he's, uh, I think he's learned a lot on how to conduct himself as a pro wrestler. And, uh, and he's just grown by leaps and bounds. Cause you know, you just like, again, like I'll keep going back to this. You have to be in there and be around guys that have been where you want to go and done what you want to do. Uh, that that goes for you know all walks of life. So uh, we're all still learning. Sky is just you know people are just seeing the tip of the iceberg of what they of what they can expect from him because the guy's he's great. 
I have a nerdy question here to ask you. And I have a nerdy answer for you. I, hope so. <laughs> I, you, I look back not only on the on your career, but the wrestling business in general. And they say, if you want to keep a secret, don't tell a wrestler or something. But you look at AEW and the way that it's it's put together, you don't see a lot of things leaking out. You don't see a lot of dirt sheet stuff. You you don't see a lot of spoilers as far as angles go. And I know you're not in the front office, but as a wrestler, maybe someone walking around the, the back, what do you contribute to that? Because I'm amazed that you don't see that out of something like an AEW. Uh, well, I mean, it's very important that those don't get out. I mean, we, you know, we tape live or we, we shoot live and then we tape. And, uh, you know, everybody wants – AEW to succeed. Nobody wants to be that guy that's leaking spoilers, and because that's, I mean, that's that's such bad. That's such a bad business move for an employee or for a wrestler. Um, yeah, I think everyone's just very adamant about you know we're, we're very very tight knit as a wrestling family, and everybody really tries to keep everything close to the veil. And uh, yeah, I, I just think we've been. I guess you can call it fortunate. You we don't have you know all it takes is one bad egg you know, to, to, to leak it. But the thing is, you know, spoilers and leaks and all that, that does that nothing positive ever comes out of a spoiler or a leak, you know? And it's like, so like we, we were, we're really cognizant on let's, you know, we're all working together. You know, sometimes we on tape shows, we do stuff that is like, you know, has a little bit of the wow factor and has a surprise element to it. And like, you know, we don't we don't want that getting out because all that's going to do is damage what we're trying to produce and damage our products. So I just think we've been we've been very fortunate. And I think we got a, a good team of people uh, in front of the camera and behind the camera that are really uh, steadfast on not letting those, you know, secrets get out or, you know, letting people know how the donuts are made. You know, because the business is so, you know, so exposed at this point, a lot way too much for my taste. So it's cool, you know, that AEW still does produce surprises because surprises in pro wrestling go mm -hmm. hand in hand and you just don't see them that often. And when you do, you know, it's usually, oh, I, I read this in a newsletter a month ago. And it's like, ugh, you know, that for me just takes it out of it. Like, I, I still just like to be a fan. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're at, I, you know, I've said this before on many podcasts in the past, but how we're at this bit, pretty much another golden era for professional wrestling and what's what what's happening with all the cross promotional stuff here? You know, it's two major promotions are now now three are working together. You know, New Japan, Impact, AEW. Um, were you surprised by that happening? And second part of that question, I guess, would be what do you how what are your legitimate true feelings about where we're at with wrestling? I'm not surprised with it because I knew. Uh, I knew kind of what AEW wanted to do when we first formed as a company. I knew that we were going to be open to working with other promotions and we weren't going to just say it, we were going to do it. So that didn't surprise me too much. Uh, the fact that we are working with so many promotions so closely is um, good. It's a bit astonishing, but it's, it's, it's really good. Uh, you know, and I like it. I like promotions working together, um, but I also like competition. You know, I think competition uh, breeds a better product. Uh, I'm, I'm all for obviously working with new Japan. When I was at ring of honor, we had a very good relationship with the, those guys. And, you know, we have a relationship now with TNA and being a guy that was a, you know, a TNA original and that was there for, you know, 13, 14 years. It's, you know, it's cool to see that, uh, that, you know, that those fences are down and, you know, that the potential matchups that could happen. So it's, it's, uh, it's really good to see, but like I said, I, I still, I still like. Part of me likes the, the idea of promotions competing against each other. You know, I'm a guy that like, uh, you know, this was before my time, but I, I like the idea of the territory days, and you know, this territory doing good, and this territory, you know, I think that's really cool too. But uh, so I think we have, I think right now, as we as we sit here in 2021, we're at a very cool, happy medium of both those of you know companies working together, but still having that competitive edge. The one thing that I always thought about and wanted to ask certain wrestlers that had a stint in WWE was one, how's the experience and how did that help you 
when you came back to TNA and eventually ROH, New Japan, and, and AEW? So for me, I mean, when I, when I got to WWE in my short stint there, I really never took wrestling seriously as a business. And what I mean by that was wrestling was my passion. It was what I always wanted to do, what I loved. And I, I, I worked my ass off. I moved across the country to train to do it. I did every show. And, and if you set up a ring, I would be there. And I worked so hard at it. And all of a sudden, I started getting paid to do it. And all of a sudden, I got a contract. And all of a sudden, I was getting weekly paychecks. And it was just like, cool, this is all part of it. When I got to WWE, I, I, I realized quickly, oh, this is a business. And uh, mm. at that time in my life, um, I don't think I was uh, mentally mature enough to handle the professional wrestling business at on that level because WWE is huh. – they've been around. They've been around forever. They, they, they have it nailed. WWE is never going anywhere. But I wasn't ready to be the businessman that I needed to be. So uh, what my run, short run taught there taught me is that, you know, yes, this is my passion. This is my, my, my heart and my soul. But I'm a businessman, and I need to treat this like a business. So I'll always be grateful for my time there for that because that was one of those lessons that kind of slapped me right in the face at the right time in my life. You are kind of closer, I would say, to the end of your career than the middle of your career. And as especially Dimitri and uh, Jason Kindle and even Darren McCarty would know, you can't outrun father time. Do you have a exit strategy as far as your personal career goes? What do you want to do? Do you want to stay in wrestling? Are you someone that like once your career is over, are you just going to disappear and you just go off with gutter candy and do whatever and you, we never see you again at a convention or anything? Well, if I just went off with gutter candy, I, I, I wouldn't be able to afford to pay my bills or anything. So that's not happening. That's, uh, no, you know what, man? When I was, when I was, uh, younger and a little more hubristic and uh, you know uh ha had a little more attitude to me i thought i was like ah, i'm not going to be doing this after i'm 40 well i'm 43 right now and i am uh i i feel like i'm in the best shape of my life i'm moving great i'm having i think my the best matches of my career so i'm not i'm not going to put an end date on my in-ring stuff i want to do that until i can't do it at the level that i want to do it at but uh there's no end in sight for that for me like i i just i love you know all the the BS and the politics and the and the crappy part about any job, professional wrestling included. That all goes away the 15, 20 minutes I'm in the ring, and that's what I live for. So uh, I'm going to do that until the wheels fall off. Uh, you know, and realistically, after those days are done, you know, I, I kind of always wanted to be a guy that just you know faded off into the sunset, and you know, you never really heard from me again. But uh, you know, yeah, I probably might end up doing something behind the scenes just because of the fa just the fact that I have experience and I have knowledge and I think I have a lot to offer to the younger generation if I choose to do that. But uh, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't even really think about that anymore. Like, obviously I know I, you know, I, I've been doing this 23 years. If I do it another 23 years, I'll be in my sixties. I don't think I want to be wrestling in my sixties, but you know, who knows? Chris Daniels and I joke all the time about how, you know, in 20 years, him and I will still be wrestling you know, uh, the Rock and Roll Express on the Indies somewhere. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a ring set up in Tupelo, Mississippi, and uh, Chris Daniels and I will be wrestling the Rock and Roll Express somewhere or doing, you know, the conventions. But I don't know, man. I've, I've, I've had a blessed career. I, you know, I, I'm still having so much fun doing it. And, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm just – I'm going to go until I, I – I think, I think I'll know exactly when I'm not at the level that uh, I want to be at, and then I'll know it's time to – to fade off and become a, uh, a civilian. Well, we know that if we see you in 20 years with the rock and roll express, there's not going to be a whole lot of bumps. Oh. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably, but, probably um, not. Probably not. If, if so, I'll be taking them. Me and me and Ricky probably. Well, you know, it's so funny. Cause I mean, you know, just talking about, I mean, I saw you right before the shutdown at an APW show, if I remember correctly, SCU, and you got a lot of gas still le left in the tank, man. I mean, it doesn't, you don't, you, you know, anyways, um, I guess for, for uh, like, as you get older in this business, I think that it's not necessarily, maybe, I don't know how it really works, but I don't know if, if there was a, a role assigned to you coming to, into AEW, like kind of like, okay, you're a 23 uh, year ring general professional. 
we need this out of this guy or whatever it is. We're going to put you in this role to play. Was that something that was said before you walked in the doors of AEW? Or is it something that you just kind of naturally morph into as a professional wrestler? Or is it like something that you choose to do? Well, I think, I mean, like I signed up to be a wrestler. Like I didn't want any title. I wanted to just come in and be a wrestler. But uh, Tony Khan and everyone involved understood that I have, you know, a wealth of experience and some unique experiences that I'm, you know, fortunate enough to be able to share with some of the younger guys. So, uh, you know, Tony put together the AEW team, the way you put together a, a good, a good sports team. For example, if we're an expansion team, you know, and, and we got, you know, you want it, you got your, your good draft picks, you, you want them, you know, the guys that are like in, in peak prime playing season form, you want them, the veterans, the guys that, you know, have, have been there and done that and won some championships, you want them. So I think they assembled that team with guys like me and Chris Daniels in that role of guys that have done that and guys that are in the prime, like Cody and the Bucks and Sky and Hangman Adam Page and guys who got, you know, the 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 whole world in front of them, like MJF and Darby and Jungle Boy. You know, everyone plays their role. And that's the same way you would that that's the same way you would build a roster on, on any sports team. You do that with wrestling. So the long-winded answer to your question is. Yeah, that's just kind of a role that I, you know, I, I'm never one of these guys that goes around and gives unsolicited advice, but I'm always willing to lend an ear and uh, and give you suggestions of what I of what I think. Well, you talked about your age and being in the best shape of your life. Now we've seen the evolution of wrestlers. Guys that are 42 or up in age, they usually had a big wrestling belly and and stuff <laughs> like that. But now. You know, guys like yourself and AJ Styles, you know, y'all are in tremendous shape and doing moves that a 25-year-old would do. So with saying all that, what is your diet? Because we do have younger wrestlers that secretly like, hey, we watch this show. So what is your diet for you to be able to maintain everything? You know, man, I've always, uh, I've always, uh, when I got serious about training, I, I'm learning about eating clean. I always was very, very cognizant about that because you, you know, like you guys know, you can't out train a bad diet. And, uh, you know, I've, I've basically stood by the way I eat for a long time, which is, you know, the standard go to, you know, moderate carbs, good, you know, uh, slow digesting carbs, good, you know, good, clean proteins, you know, lean beef, chicken, uh, a lot of salmon, stuff like that. Uh, and, and I give myself, you know, one day a week to eat whatever I want. And that's, I think also, uh, you know, cause if you, if you don't do that, you're going to drive yourself crazy. But with, with dieting and like everything else, it's, it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, uh, it's the repetition. It's, it's, you know, consistency. That's the word I'm looking for. It's consistency. You know, you got to stick with it. As I've gotten older, I've tried different things. I've tried keto. I, as I've gotten older, my, the way I train is different. Um, I, uh, you know, I, uh, the way the, uh, you know, I focus a lot more on cardiovascular stuff and I do a lot of H I T style training and, you know, explosive style training because pro wrestling is all explosion and movement. And the way I wrestle, I, I just, I, I wrestle smarter. And, um, but yeah, my diet has been pretty consistent. I've always been a guy that, you know, I've always, I've always ate clean for the most part, you know, I, but having said that, like I said, I give myself, I give myself a day to eat whatever I want. And if I, you know, if I'm hanging with my buddies, uh, you know, I'm going to have some beverages and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to eat junk food. But all I can say is that, you know, you, you, you're an athlete, you're an athlete, you know, you guys, you guys know, you find something that works with you and you got to stick with it. But if you don't stick with it, it's not going to work. How much input do you have on your character in this whole forbidden door thing? As us as wrestling fans, we have been just geeking out. We've been excited. This has been the most talked about thing in wrestling in the past. I'd even say 10 years right now. And when I think of Frankie Kazarian, I and truthfully, I don't know how your exit was out of TNA, but I, I think some wrestlers may kind of have that PTSD of, oh, I don't want to go back there. As far as you do, they say, hey, listen, we've got this idea. Do you want to show up here or guess where you're going to be on, uh, you know, Wednesday night? You know, you're I'll see you at impact. 
I think there's a little bit of A and a little bit of B to answer that. I mean, I think like if I if I or somebody in my position went to AEW or to TNA and you know uh, pitched something that they might be interested in, they would certainly listen. Um, but also, I I think if I was told this is what we're doing, I would uh, I would do it because it's my job. But I would certainly you know let my you know I I would certainly question it if I needed to question it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that TNA is doing the things they're doing because I, the guys running it are friends of mine and I'm glad to see it. Uh, you know, when I left TNA, it was a completely different team and it was a completely different team from when I got to TNA. And uh, and yeah, to be honest, when I left TNA, I honestly thought, you know, n- never again, because the management team in place at that time had just, in my opinion, run it into, uh, you know, TNA had built so much equity and they just so quickly ran it into the ground. So I was kind of done and I thought, you know, this was, that was a fun chapter in my career. I had some great times there, but it's time to move on. But uh, yeah, you know, but wrestling in 2021, so unpredictable. Uh, who knows? Who knows going to show up on our show? Who knows going to show up on Impact? Who knows going to show up in WWE? It's, it's, it's wild. You know, it's, it's almost like the Wild West, which I like because wrestling needs unpredictability. I think that's what's missing a lot in today's product. Frankie, I just want to pitch you one idea real quick. I know you're busy. I, but I got one too, Dennis. I got an idea uh, for him too. Oh, well, let, let me do mine first because I have a feeling we're on the same page, Lars. I would like to see you attack someone on AEW dressed as suicide. We could get you. Yeah. <laughs> come come on. I was going to say, he. I, this is custom built for him to come back and just like, that's my gimmick, you know, motherfucker. Like, give me oh. that. And then just, just tear everybody down. And, I mean, oh. come on! This is this is custom made for you. Like hey, you're tell the you what, old dog. missed you're out the, on this one. You're the I old dog coming in and just like you know. <sighs> no, I'm not gonna run down that hill. I'm gonna walk down that hill and fuck them all. I <laughs> don't know. I don't know if there's uh, a force on earth that could get me back into that suit. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't. I you know what? I I just there's so many. You know that's. So, there's so many dark <laughs> times associated with that. I don't know that that would be a case that I don't know that that would happen. I don't know. It would, uh, they would have to put a lot of extra cheese on my Whopper. If that would, <laughs> you know hey, hey, you sure it's not behind that door behind you? No, 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 yeah, no, that, 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 that damn thing sat in my closet for too long and scared me and scared my wife every time we walked past it. Cause, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, not, not, a, not a comfortable outfit. Not, not, yeah. Would you, you know you could have modified it? <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. After I left, they modified it. And they, and they, yeah. You know, when I, when I had it, it was just a giant, there was, you couldn't see, you couldn't breathe. It was terrible. Oh man! Oh my God, that's funny. <laughs> oh yeah, it's yeah. I yeah, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna uh, pass on that particular creative. That's All right. Well, looks like I, it looks like we're not we're me and Dennis are obviously not getting a job there anytime soon. You know, what I mean, with these bad ideas. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I have, I, have a, I have a good idea. Are you gonna right. challenge for the AEW Heavyweight Championship in in the future? Hey man. I would, you know, I've had tag team gold in AEW. I was the first ever uh, AEW tag team champion. I would love to have singles gold. That's certainly an aspiration for me. That's certainly on my to-do list. You know, um, you know, if and when this tag team thing winds winds up, uh, I, you know, I still have goals as a single wrestler. I've dedicated the last decade of my life basically to being a tag team wrestler. You know, and I've kind of put those single goals on hold. But when that time comes, uh, you know, I certainly I still have things I want to accomplish. Well, definitely looking forward to what you and Christian have in store for Christian Cage, I should say. Thank you. I I was just about to say we've gone 30 some odd minutes in this podcast. We've not even brought up your match with Christian, which was phenomenal. I mean, it opened the show. You're trusted. To welcome in Christian Cage, who was a high-valued signee, when they come to you and, and listen, you've had many battles with Christian. So I look, I, I've watched a bunch of your TNA stuff with him back when it happened. You're trusted. You're asked to do this with Christian as he comes in. It's got to be an honor for you, even at this point in your career. Very much so. Very much an honor. Uh, 
not a whole lot of guys I respect more than Christian. Uh, just going back to talking about elevating guys. Uh, when I was in TNA and I had a little run with Christian, a couple month feud, uh, I learned more about professional wrestling in the span of three months working with Christian than I had the previous 10 years I was in the business. The guy's that good. He just, he has what I like to call just a wrestling IQ that's off the page. He's, I don't know if he'll ever get the credit he deserves for how good he is. Uh, mm. You know, personally, he's a, 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 one of my best friends in the business. I'm so happy for him and to see his journey bring him to AEW. Cause being away, having having it not even being away, having it taken away from you the way it was from him, uh, is tough, you know, especially when he was at the peak of his career. And to be away from for seven years and to come back in that shape and not not only not miss a step, but be better than ever. I don't know if I could pull that off. And I don't I don't know a whole lot of guys that could. So uh very, very honored that that match is always going to hold a special place to me. Um, thrilled to do it. And I'll tell you what, I can't wait to do it again. All that did was light my fire. And it was almost like a reminder of how good he is. Cause like, man, and I forgot how much I enjoyed wrestling guys of that caliber and guys that are that good. I mean, is there, do you feel like the guys in AEW, do you see a lot of potential like, super superstars there or do you feel like because i i i've seen a lot of these guys in the indies and i know what and since they've come into to, to aew they've gone up um who are the guys that you kind of can see right now who have that superstar potential like even more than what they are yeah i mean you, you know you got to look at a guy like like jungle boy for example he's so young and he's you know and this is the first time people are getting to see him on a national stage and he's only going to get better. Um, you know, obviously a guy like MJF who's at his young age has just <laughs> gets it, you know, from a, from a in ring perspective and from a, a character perspective uh, you know, guys like Darby Allen and just, you know, I think those guys are going to be the faces of the company in the next five, 10 years. And, uh, and all, uh, let's put it this way, all those guys and a lot, a, a lot more guys, have uh, what I call superstar potential, you know, how far they go is up to them. You know, right, this right. is, this is, you know, I've seen so many guys come down the pipe that were, had it all, had everything, were talented, had the look, jacked, could talk, but just didn't have the right attitude or just didn't know how to play the game. And now they're not even in the business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so much more that goes into it than just the in-ring stuff. You know, you got to learn how to play the game. You got to have that, you got to have a good attitude. Um, so if those guys can do those things, then the world is their oyster. If we can rewind a little bit back to your time and fortune, yeah. you know, when um, when you was around the guys like Ric Flair, who has a wealth of knowledge, what was the kind of, th what was the stories that he had for you guys? And then how did that elevate your game? And then second, did you expect AJ Styles to be the star that he is now? Well, I mean, when it comes to Rick, uh, at that point, you know, most of the stories were, you know, about stuff that <laughs> happened outside of the ring. And, you know, <laughs> and, you know, what, man, in wrestling, you learn you learn more uh, in cars and in bars than you do in the ring, man. So but, you know, having said that. Honestly, you could be sitting around with a guy like Rick having a couple beverages and he could be telling you these stories, but you know, you might not know it at the time you're learning because you're learning what to do and what not to do. But Rick was just a good, a, a good example of a guy that would, you know, super knowledgeable that would just tell us little things like slow down here, you know, you know, turn up the intensity here. And again, because who else, who, who better to learn from than a guy like, you know, the best wrestler to ever lace boots. Um, but, uh, yeah, personally, I, I had a lot more fun hanging out with Rick outside of the ring. Uh, as far as AJ Styles goes, uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, AJ Styles, in my opinion, is the best wrestler in the world, and I've thought that for the last 15 years. Um, you know, I, he, uh, again, one of my best friends, uh, but a guy that's just, you know, his phenomenal, you know, to pardon the pun, pun intended, actually. You know, I'm so glad that he finally got the opportunity to 
step up to that stage and for the world to know what myself and fans and guys like you have known all along that he's just unbelievable. So I uh, couldn't be happier for him. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy when I talk about things like attitude and things like conducting yourself like a professional, you know, AJ Styles, you know, clicks all those boxes. I When I look at AEW and what they're doing now, I kind of go back and, and not in a bad way. I kind of compare them to the New York Yankees and George Steinbrenner, where despite what you feel about the New York Yankees or George Steinbrenner, here's an owner that cared about his team that would constantly pay the luxury tax to fill the best players in their positions. Then you look at the rest of the you know teams, and I'm talking about up north, and then you have a guy that would cut 20 players to make $500 million. You work in a company now that really is investing in its people. Uh, Tony Khan, and one of the things I, I really, I, I guess I'm excited about is, here's a guy that's going out buying music for the for his guys to come out to uh, Orange Cassidy. Well, who was there? Was another guy that uh, he bought Jungle, Jungle Boy. Boy. Jungle Boy, yeah. I mean, as a wrestler, how how did that? That's got to make you feel like you know what? I I want to be in this company forever. And then as a musician, does it make you go? Maybe Gutter Candy will have the Frankie Kazarian theme song coming out next. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, Tony is a, uh, you know, I can't sing his praises enough. Uh, he's he's a, a great, he's, first of all, he's very passionate. He's a huge fan. He knows, you know, he knows more about wrestling almost than anybody I've ever met, but which is cool because, yes, he's my boss, but he's also a guy that I can just sit there and talk about, you know, Kurt Henning and Nick Bockwinkel matches with or talk about Mid-South stuff with or talk about, you know, 80s WWF, the stuff I grew up on with, he's, you know, he's so very knowledgeable and that, that comes across. Um, yeah. The music part, that's cool. You know, that, that means he's invested in that, that character. You know, he had a vision for uh, this, for this character coming out of certain music and he goes out and it's going to cost him a few bucks. He's going to do it. And it's really cool. And it's, for my music, the, the SCU thing, my band, my, my other band Vex Temper, we actually we recorded that. Because I we recorded that I was using that when we were still in um, Ring of Honor, and when we came to AEW, the music was familiar enough that fans knew it. So, and I own it, so AEW was, you know, uh, was giving enough to let me do that. And uh, I'm sure down the line, if I want to freshen it up or, or you know create a whole new song, they'll let me do that, which is cool as a musician for me because I know I know what I want my persona to sound like you know more so than somebody that's going to write music for me you know that's why the seu theme I, I i wrote that song with the chant in mind with the with the people chanting scu because i was like wrestling fans love to chant i said and we'll do it and we'll hit it the hook will be the scu part and, and it was and it worked and it's actually me sky and cd singing on that trap singing in bad quotes yeah uh but uh yeah it's it's really cool man it's 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 cool to know that uh you know, whenever I need to freshen up something, I can I can bring my own music to the table because that certainly wouldn't happen anywhere else. Because a lot of times they control everything about your persona and how you look and how you sound and how you appear. We we talk a lot on the podcast, and Lars is you know we we try or pushing Lars, trying to push Lars into getting into more wrestling theme music as as a guy who's been there as a musician. What advice maybe could you give Lars? Because I, I kind of want to sit back and listen to you two talk a little bit about music. That was one of the my visions of how the show would go and maybe get into a little bit of the philosophy behind uh, wrestling theme songs. There's no advice I can give Lars about music. I mean, <laughs> let's first and foremost, but like with wrestling themes, like it's, um, you know, it's 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 so a song for a wrestler is so important and so relatable, exactly. you know, because I grew up, you know, I grew up in the, in the eighties and I grew up watching WWF television. And, you know, my first favorite wrestler was Tito Santana and I loved Bret Hart and I loved those, the workhorses and those guys, but I love the ultimate warrior and I love mm -hmm. demolition. Why did I love the ultimate? Why did I love the ultimate warrior? Because he looked like a comic book hero, which I was into comic books and he came out to heavy metal. And I was into, Guns N' Roses and Judas Priest and Metallica when I was a kid. So here's this guy that looks like a comic book hero coming out to music I listen to. And why not? Same with 
Same with Demolition. You know, they come out to, to a heavy Rick Derringer guitar music, and I'm like, fuck, that's cool. So it's just like it's so it's so important to a character. Like, you know, it's especially when you're in a packed arena and you hear that first the first note and the people know exactly who's coming out. It's it's just it's so it's so familiar. Like when people hear the Undertaker's gong, when people hear the first, you know, the first chord of of uh, of Bret Hart's music, anything, it's just so that's that's instantly that's who that is, you know. So it's it's really important. I can't stress how important music is in pro wrestling. Well, it's, it was a good segue, Dennis, because actually my my question uh, to you was actually on this topic because you know you're very obviously a very creative person. You're a creative person with the wrestling. You're a creative per person with your music. I mean, I know where I get my inspiration. It always seems to come on when I'm driving or like three o'clock in the morning, like when I can't sleep or something. Yeah. So the creativity as a wrestler and the creativity as a musician for you, how and when does that come? Is it the same kind of thing or, or and, and if not, how does it differ? Almost the same way, you know, like same thing. I'll be like on a, on a flight and I'll be just, you know, listening to a podcast or something and something will pop into my head. Wow. You know what? If I, if I hook a guy's arm like this and then mm -hmm. drop down and do this, that might be a cool move. Just, it'll just pop in there. Um, and yeah, the same with music, you know, like I think for me, like, uh, I get inspired by playing with musicians that are better than I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I really, I like to challenge myself with stuff like that. The band I'm in now, the, the gutter candy, the lead singer is an incredible musician and I'm inspired every time I'm around him just because he's, cause he pushes me and he, and he kind of forces more, more creativity out of me, which is, which is cool. But yeah, Lars, same thing. It just, it can come. You know, I, I still watch a lot of wrestling, but, you know, full disclosure, I watch pretty much exclusively only stuff from like 75 to like maybe 2005, just because that's kind of my, you know, I just, that's the stuff I prefer. Not to right, say right. anything disparaging about today's product, but that's the stuff I enjoy. So going back and watching stuff like that and watching what guys did back then and thinking, ooh, I could put a, I could put a, you know, a little spin on that move and make it very modern. The same way I'll listen to a song. I'll go, that's a cool riff. Wonder if maybe if you kind of did that same type of groove, but sped it up a little bit, that would be cool. And you maybe they could do a good hook. You know, same type of things. It just it hits me, you know, because I'm I'm always listening to music and I'm always thinking about wrestling. So I'm always it's always it's always kind of hitting me from, you know, that's it. Yeah. I, I, I can I can relate. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just gonna when it, that's you know, thank thank God for, you know, thank God for the iPhones now, because you can you know, I don't know how many riffs I've hummed into this or how many oh. things I've written down of like, oh, this would be cool. You know, you know, even like promo ideas, like I'll, 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 I'll be reading something. I'll be like, dude, what a line. And so I'll write it down. Like I got to hit it. And every time I need to do something creatively, I'll, we need this, I'll go back to them. I'm like, what a, like, ah, that line. So it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's all, I'm, I'm always thinking, I'm always on. The red light's always on. Mm. All right there, Frankie. Y'all, you talked about music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I was an athlete, and 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 and, and, and growing up, with, with, did you play baseball? Because you grew up in California, so you yeah, know, we had sports year round, all kind of sports. Were you a baseball player, or a baseball player, and what got you into wrestling that made you who you are today? So yes, I grew up. I grew up playing baseball. Loved baseball. Baseball was my sport. It was the sport I was best at. Um, I played football in high school, but I was, I was a late bloomer. So in high school, when I was a freshman, I was five foot tall and a hundred pounds and by far the smallest kid on the team. Still uh, Katie Williams, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so yeah. And I was, you know, and I grew up and I got a little bit taller, but I was never big, but I played football all four years. So what that did, that helped, that built a lot of character in me. Cause I got my ass handed to me every day of the week playing football but I loved it, and that, and I, and I stuck it out. Um, wrestling, you know, the the reason I became a professional wrestler is because of the movie Rocky Three, and here's yeah. why: I was such a huge fan of Sly and of Arnold and of '80s action movies, but especially the Rocky franchise. And me and my cousin would watch Rocky Three at nauseum, and it was my favorite movie. So one day my mom took me to the video store, me and my cousin, and we went in and we saw 
what we thought was Thunderlips and Clubber Lang on the cover of this thing ended up being WrestleMania one, Mr. T and Hulk Hogan, obviously. <laughs> But I didn't know what it was, and I and I we, we I you know I'm thinking like is, is this like a backstory on Thunderlips and Clever Lang? And I asked you know asked my mom to rent it for me, and she's like, okay, me and my cousin, and so we rent it, we bring it home, we put it in, and first thing I see is uh, you know Tito Santana versus the Executioner, and what is pro wrestling? I, and I was hooked. I was hooked, and my my dad my dad came in, my dad watched wrestling when he was a kid, and he's and so he started watching with me. And I was just glued, like instantly, like, well, I guess I'm a professional wrestling fan now because I could not get enough of it. But the reason I got into it is because of the movie Rocky Three. So I'll always credit Sylvester Stallone for my career, man, because I mean, who knows? I'm sure I would have discovered it because wrestling became so big at that time. But uh, yeah, that's that was the gateway drug for me, man. And then the minute the minute I discovered pro wrestling, like everything else was put on the back burner. And I was one of those obsessed kids that had yeah. every toy, every game, every magazine, just every shirt. I was ridiculed at school when wrestling wasn't cool because I still liked it. And you know, you I was put made a chokehold on him. Oh man. No, again, going back, I was too small, man. I was too small, but I could run fast. So uh, yeah, man. And it was just, it was just one of those honest to God is like, I can, I can remember, you know, the, the minute I saw professional wrestling, where I was sitting at my parents' house, the light came on and it's never gone off. We have time for a question a piece before we wrap this up. And I'm going to piggyback off what you were just talking about. And where is your fandom at now? Uh, I'm good friends with like Eli Drake and he doesn't watch a single thing of wrestling. Couldn't tell you what's going on in the industry. Then you have guys like Petey Williams, who's doing a po podcast. As you've gotten older into the business, where is the adult Frankie Kazarian's love and for the professional wrestling wrestling now? I'll always love professional wrestling. That's, you know, that's a given, uh, you know, do I like some eras better than others? Yes. Um, but I will never, ever, ever say a disparaging word about professional wrestling. Uh, you know, it's, it's what's, you know, it's what's put every meal in my son's stomach. It's yeah. bought me my house. It's, it's, it's given me a life that I could only dream of. Um, you know, I don't, I, I can't say that I follow everything that's going on today. Uh, firstly, because there's so much of it, you know, there's so much pro wrestling. It's hard to follow. Um, but I like uh, going back to what I said earlier, I still really, really, really enjoy watching stuff that I grew up on because I put myself right back into that place. I was when I saw it. So, uh, and I'll, I'll always watch that, that stuff I'll, I'll forever. Um, you know, I watch a lot of our stuff we do. I'll watch it. I'll have guys ask me to watch their segment or their match, and I certainly will. But um, I don't go out of my way the way I would when I was younger. You know, like I could – the Monday Night Wars I couldn't miss. I would I would watch one and record the other. Um, you know, I'm certainly not doing that now. I'm a little bit busier. Um, but, you know, professional wrestling I will I will always love. Lars, well, you, Lars, Lars, yes. Lars, no, no, you always get the last question. <laughs> you no, always I was gonna, get the last. No, no you get no, a question after me. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You get the last question. So let okay. me go now. Okay. You mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you mentioned your son. Um, I have two sons and a daughter myself, and my son wants to follow in my footsteps as a baseball player. Um, you know what I'm getting at. Um, yeah. Are you going to push him in that direction? Or are you going to let him make his own decisions as as a dad? You know, you just want your kid to be happy but motivated to do something. I will tell you this. As of right now, my son, my son, his name is Rebel. He's eight years old. And he could not give a shit that I'm a professional <laughs> wrestler. He, he, especially, I remember a couple years ago, uh, um, I think – Perhaps to teenage, it was probably Ring of Honor, but I was on television and my wife was like, Look, there's daddy. And he literally looked at the screen and went, Oh, and went back to what he was doing. So it's like he could care less. <laughs> you know, he's gotten, as I've gotten, as he's gotten older and, you know, he's got to go to a couple of shows. He likes getting in the ring, you know, and he likes bouncing around. And just recently, like, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll watch a little bit and, like, you know, when he's there, he loves it and he thinks it's cool that I do it. But he doesn't think it's special. You know, he thinks it's just like, oh, yeah, my dad wrestles on TV. That's, you know, like, you know, at this point in his life, he's hell bent on being an archaeologist. And I'm like, hell, hell man, you know, do it. Yeah, of course, you know, like any father, I want what's best for him and I want him to be happy. Uh, 
you know, if he gets that bug down the road, it, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, but uh, I don't know. He's he's a real bright kid. So maybe maybe he's a little too smart to become a professional wrestler. At least that's my hope, you know. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'm all in for whatever he wants to do, man. But at this point, he's not he's not too interested. He thinks it's cool, but that's kind of where it begins and ends. That's cool. Well, you know, I, first of all, thanks for coming and joining us tonight. It was super awesome to get to know you better like this. I guess my last question is: it's more of a. Um, I guess it would be a personal question in the in the sense, and I always like to ask the guys who been uh you know obviously you've been very successful in the business of professional wrestling and you've been around a long freaking time and uh i guess my question to you because i i had a like a mentor kind of thing and i and i know you mentioned christian um but what, what was there one particular guy besides your trainer besides christian that and and let's say maybe a, even a, let's let's eliminate tag team partners too is there one guy that you can kind of go this guy right here helped me out the most or set me in, in a direction or, or something that's very, that, that was very profound in your life. I mean, the, 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 the easy answer is Chris Daniels, but uh, you know, we already talked a lot about him and you know, he's, he's so much more of a friend than he is a mentor, but early on, certainly he was one of those guys. I mean, that's uh, th th honestly, there's so many Lars. I, I mean, I could, you know, even on the, you know, the business end of things, uh, a guy like Terry Taylor, you know, like there's so many things I learned from him about, you know, the behind the scenes thing, going back to talking about being a businessman, you know, uh, you know, a guy like him that was just there to mentor me. And again, somebody like Christian, you know, he, uh, you know, like not to repeat answers I've already given you, but you know, those are the guys that were important to me uh, early on uh, uh, Nova, Mike Bucci, you know, I, I was a tag team partner with him. He was Simon Dean in WWE. He was a guy that was a, you know, uh, uh, that, that had been there and done that and was really, you know, kind of grooming me. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I've been fortunate enough to have so many of those type of guys and to have conversations with, with guys that have been where I want to go. And, you know, you, you know, that's what I said. You, you, you know, you, you, that's, that's, that's how you learn is by talking to the guys that have done what you want to do. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's not, there's not just that one guy. I mean, if, honestly, I could say my original trainer, Killer Kowalski, just cause he was so, you know, he was so instrumental and so special and, you know, still to this day, I wrestle for him. I want, you know, I want his legacy to continue on because, you know, I think a lot of the old, the old timers are starting to get forgotten a little bit. And I don't like that. You know, I want people to know who Killer Kowalski is cause he's a super important name in professional wrestling. We're about to wrap this up. We didn't ask any fan questions, but there was one fan question I just want to touch on super quick. A quick answer would be great, but you guys are now the sole owners of Wednesday night. Do you feel like this is a major victory in the wrestling world against the evil wrestling empire? Or is it just, you know what, they're moving, not a big deal. It was a fan question. I thought it was a great question that we've not really touched on, but you've you've essentially ran one of the big dogs out of its own yard on, on Wednesday nights. I mean, I think, I think it's a victory in the fact for the fans because they get to, we don't have to split that audience on Wednesday nights. I think it's, you know, NXT viewership is going to go up and AEW viewership is going to go up and that's a win-win situation. The more people watching our product, the better high tide rises all ships, man. I legitimately want everybody to succeed. Uh, you know, when the business was at its hottest, people were making the most money was, those Monday night wars. And if we could even get close to that time again, I'm all for it, man. Super duper politically correct answer. Well played. <laughs> hey, that was a good hey. fan question, Dan. This yeah. yeah. Hey, 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 man, that's it though. You know, like I not, we're not, you know, I don't think anybody's running anybody off because WWE is going nowhere. I, I, yeah. I legitimately want, I have friends up there. I have friends in every company and I want all of them to make pile of money and i want them to be able to support their family i want pro wrestling to grow uh on on every level well where can people find you what do you have your fingers in because for everybody at home the show is over for us so we'll say our goodbyes up the air but uh frankie can you put yourself over for a sec yeah man i'm in social media frankie kazarian at twitter uh you know my bands follow my band gutter candy uh also at on twitter uh 
If you want an American Rebel cigar, which is mine and Cody Rhodes Cigar Company, uh, Sto- stogiebird.com, and then plug in American Rebel, and you can get everything you need there, man. Other than that, just keep watching AEW on Wednesday nights because we're doing we're really hitting our stride and doing some cool stuff. Frankie, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Yes, appreciate you. you guys, man. Really thank do. You so thank much. you, man.